Originally called Hollings Hill, this Tudor style Edwardian house, which stands in nine acres of beautiful parkland with fine views of nearby hills, was designed by Yorkshire architect Walter Briley in 1909 for brother and sister William and Anne Howarth. William and Anne were the children of Thomas Howarth, who lived between 1819 and 1891. And he was the most important cotton manufacturer in Accrington from the 1850s. William and Anne were bequeathed the house, a collection of paintings and antiquities, plus a sum of money for the building's upkeep to the people of Accrington. Many of the finest country houses in England date from the decade preceding the Great War, and Hollings Hill is no exception. The Arts and Crafts star made reference not just to former historical periods such as Tudor times and the Jacobean age, but also insisted on the use of fine materials and fine craftsmanship. The fireplace behind me is a very good example of this. It's distinguished not by the florid decoration of Victorian taste, but by the use of quality materials, simple stone, hand-smithed ironwork. The only decoration really is this heraldic device, this counter-company pattern, used to enhance the mantelpiece. This design is repeated at various points throughout the house. Further up we have a, a tripartite division in this oak panelling which is distinguished also by its, its fielded and recessed panels. The three panels which are recessed were probably used for displaying a clock or matching garniture or maybe candlesticks or expensive porcelain. Higher up we have a plaque which I think we should have a closer look at. Here in the hallway, one of the most important paintings is by James Baker Pine, displayed in the typical Victorian way of a heavy, gilt, swept frame, pierced at the corners and the centres, and also with this um, gilt inner slip, which was the Victorian taste. Rather heavy for me personally, but that's the way they like to display it. James Baker Pine was particularly well known for depicting the English landscape, though this is actually of Bacharach am Rhein in Germany. It's been said that nobody could depict the landscape finer than Pine, other than perhaps William Turner. Bacharach am Rhein, Germany. Well, 1850 was the time when the railways in Great Britain had really reached their zenith, and in Europe too. And for the gentry and newly rich industrialists, it was a time to travel. James Baker Pine was perhaps the, the artist of choice for recording those visits, for recording those journeys, bringing them back to their country mansions so that they could display them for their friends to admire. This is painted in the English Romantic style. Romanticism insists on the use of natural effects, gathering storms, sunlit foregrounds. Often they depict landscapes which have a uh, a great perspective, a long viewpoint, across a lake or a mountainside, castles on the hillside, peasants in the foreground, sunlit foregrounds, but with gathering storms in the distance, perhaps presaging uh, a future which, which is not so bright. This painting is by William Sher and is entitled Harvest Time. It contrasts somewhat with the painting we've looked at by James Baker Pine, in depicting a, an English rural scene. This is typical of Cher's work because he came from the New Forest in Hampshire. Um, it's very reminiscent of, of that area, isn't it, with this English idyll. 
Cher is actually self-taught and started out as a, a sign writer, a coach painter. And it was partly due to his experience in building up the glazers on the doors of the fine coaches that he became expert in, in painting. His sons were also artists and it's believed that by the mid-1850s Charles and Henry were helping William to finish his paintings. This dates from 1853 and I wouldn't be at all surprised if Charles and Henry had actually done some of the less detailed work in the painting. It's said that by the 1860s William was actually only doing the most important features of the paintings that he sold, such as the farmer here on his horseback chatting with the peasants in the field who are harvesting the, the new hay. This magnificent painting entitled My Lady's Palfrey is by John Frederick Herring Sr. Like Cher, Herring was also self-taught and began life as a sign painter and coach painter. In his late teens he eloped to Doncaster where he became an engraver for the Doncaster Gazette recording the winners of the various races. Eventually, Herring took to painting these wonderful horses, particularly the winner of the St. Ledger. He didn't have much success initially and had to continue with his job as a coach painter and even took to actually driving the coaches between New York and London. In time, however, he was discovered and his paintings of the winners became much sought after. This is a truly wonderful example and shows very clearly how Herring was able to portray with a huge skill every single hair, every artery, every vein on the horse's flank. Particularly noteworthy is the way in which Herring was able to show the sheen on the horse's hindquarters. It's been said that no horse has ever had a finer sheen put on its flank than by John Herring in the whole history of art. Faith by Lord Leighton, modelled here by Dorothy Dean. Real name, Ada Pullen, a cockney. Legend has it that George Bernard Shaw was actually inspired by the relationship between Lord Leighton and his model here, Ada Pullen, or the two characters, Professor Higgins and Eliza Doolittle. When we look at her today, in this angelic pose, she seems a far cry from the Eliza Doolittle <laughs> that we know and love in My Fair Lady. We're now in the music room. This was, however, originally the games room, where William would entertain his gentleman friends to billiards after dinner. Then they would perhaps retire to the dais, the raised dais behind me, which we'll have a closer look at. The fireplace here clearly records the date 1909, the year in which the house was built. But to the left here we see the letter W, reminding us that this house was built by William. And to the right we have W and A and H superimposed, William and Anne Howarth. All three exhibition rooms on the ground floor have fine plaster and wooden mouldings, often in the Tudor style which is typical of the arts and crafts period. These mouldings are often abundant with foliage, animals, plants and birds, reflecting Anne and William's love of nature. Let's have a little closer look at them. The fireplace here has a really fine frieze running all the way around, depicting a, a broken, seeded ribbon design. And within it, we've got a sort of vine pattern with grapes and rose hips, tiny little gelder roses, and in the centre of the fireplace, the Lancashire rose. In the corner here, we've got an oak leaf design. The oak leaf 
and of course acorn, its seed, always symbolising fortitude. Fortitude in strength, mind and body. The Tudor style is also reflected in this very fine linen fold panelling with its exquisite pierced quatrefoil motif in the centre. And running all the way around the two display cabinets to left and right of the fireplace is a veritable menagerie of carving. And if we looked very, very carefully, hidden away, we might find even a little mouse. We're now in the gift shop. This was once the dining room and is particularly noteworthy for its fine plaster ceiling with wonderful decoration made up of leaves and plants and flowers and also this fine quatrefoil motif or four-leaf clover design. We're now in what was once the drawing room but now along with the other two rooms on this floor it actually houses a permanently changing exhibition and as we can see, it's this year on the theme of the cityscape, perhaps local, perhaps on the national level. I'm sure William and Anne would have approved of the invitation to all artists to come and display their works here at the Howarth Gallery. Unlike the other exhibition rooms on the ground floor, the drawing room here has a very fine vaulted ceiling, which is also heavily decorated. Only here the theme seems to be that of fruition, things coming to germination, hence it's resplendent with seed heads and again the, the acorn, symbol of new growth. New growth, fruition, coming to life, that surely is what art is all about. The stained glass window here depicts to the left the coat of arms of Accrington. On the right hand side, the coat of arms of Lancashire, with three Lancashire roses. But in the centre we have the monogram of William and Anne Howarth. The Tudor style is continued in this solid oak staircase. We notice the particularly substantial new posts here, the top of which are decorated with this um, pierced heart design. This is a motif that is repeated elsewhere in the house and I'd rather think of it as a, a symbol of Anne and William's love of fine craftsmanship. This craftsmanship is very evident here in the use of wooden dowels, purely wooden dowels, for holding the whole staircase together. Another element of Tudor design is the raked balustrading. The painting on the landing here is by Claude Verne, an 18th century French academic painter, and it's entitled Storm at Sea. Verne was particularly interested in depicting the climate, not least because in the 18th century there was a taste for paintings which we refer to as vanitas. Vanitas are paintings which in some way record the transitiveness of human life, which is often most apparent in cataclysmic events, such as depicted here in this shipwreck scene. An Accrington man, Joseph Briggs, in 1891 decided to set out for America and seek his fortune. After working in various jobs, he ended up in New York working for the famous firm of Tiffany & Co. He worked there for 40 years, eventually becoming Tiffany's right-hand man. Sadly, by the early 1930s, the firm had fallen into decline. But Briggs had remarkable foresight and decided to send three consignments of the most representative glass back to his native town of Accrington, which is housed here in the Howarth Gallery. It consists of over 140 pieces and is the largest and most expensive collection in Europe. Let's go and meet the curator, Jennifer Rennie. So Jennifer, Hello. it really is a privilege to be here amongst all these amazing works of art. Thank you very much. But I've got a very simple question to start with. Please tell us what's so special about Tiffany Glass. 
Well, there's lots of things that are special about Tiffany glass, but if we focus on this gladiola vase that's in the second of our four Tiffany rooms, I think it sums it up um, very clearly. The unique thing about Tiffany and his marvellous Art Nouveau vases, glass, is that he, through practice and using technicians, spending lots of money on research and development, he learnt how to decorate the glass at the time of it remaining molten, so you get a unified effect that you don't find in other glassmakers of the time. So all this decoration, the leaves and the gladiola flowers, and everything is all done um, using a number of people at the same time, at the time when the glass is still malleable. The marvellous finished effect um, is that you only have so much control over what happens when you work with glass like that. It's not like cut glass. Um, the glass itself, the liquidity of the glass, the nature of the glass, um, plays a part in the, if you like, the design of the finished thing. There's only so much control that the makers, the gaffers, had over the exact positioning of those leaves and the exact shape of those flowers. That was to do with the process and the fact that they were using glass. So That's what's quite, so special. There could be quite a lot of, uh, of wastage then, really, because there could. occasionally I'm it would sure go there wrong. Was. I'm, I'm sure there was, certainly with the um, very technically difficult things, mm. there was a lot of wastage, yeah. Yes. So in some ways, we, we might be looking at a, a happy accident. It's serendipity. Exactly, exactly so, yes. Certainly it ties in really well with um, one of the big influences on Tiffany, which was William Morris and his idea of truth to materials, because, as I say, the fluidity, uh, the marvellous uh, liquidity of glass um, is trapped in the finished object. It's sort of infused, isn't it? The patterns it is. infused within it is, yes. the core of the glass itself. Yes. Gorgeous. And if you compare that with um, other examples in the collection of intaglio types, I think it's very easy to um, see well, why these are so important. That's a very technical term, intaglio. What does yes. that mean precisely? It simply means cut. When you cut glass, you allow it to cool or, or even go cold, and then you use a wheel to cut. So you're sort of superimposing the decoration on the surface of the, of the vase. Whereas with this example, the decoration is in, bedded in, as, you, say, as you just said. Yes. It's part of the, uh, the fabric of the, the, fabric itself. Of the vase itself. It's not superimposed. Am I right in saying you've got an example over there of intaglio glass? Yes, I think we have one or two very fine examples, actually. Could we have a closer look? Certainly. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer, this actually reminds me very much of the work of uh, René Lalique or Emile Gallet. I think, I think that's right. I, th I think um, it, it is very reminiscent of Lalique. Um, and of course, it's a marvellous example of intaglio cut glass. Extraordinary number of hours taken. Um, over 200 hours just to carve oh, the vase. It's a well-recorded piece. And how would the, the work actually be, be achieved? Well, the, simply the vase, as all the others, was, was blown and then allowed to go cold and then cut with a wheel. Um, it actually shows the different stages in the life of a rose, if you like, from budding yes. to um, going into full flower and then getting to the point where when you touch the rose it sort of collapses onto the right. grass. It's very beautiful. But it isn't what we prize Tiffany particularly for, because of course in this example the glass has been mastered. It has been allowed to cool and then it's been carved. So if you like, the de decoration is superimposed on the vase, which is how it very much how it contrasts with um, the, the gladiola vase that we were looking at earlier, I where understand. the decoration is um, made at the time of the glass being molten, and there's this yes. partnership between the, the material and the maker. Whereas here the glass is just a vehicle for the it's design. It's a vehicle for the design. Exactly. It's much more, I think you said earlier, like a sculpture in a way. Indeed. Very beautiful and very difficult to do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but not what we mainly prize Tiffany for. Mm. We see also um, what's very reminiscent of, a, of an organic form here. Yes. Uh, and I think I'm right in saying that at this particular time, the Art Nouveau period, uh, was inspired very much by plant forms. Plants and, and flowers, flowers but also vegetables actually. Yes. We have examples here, as I'm sure you, you know, um, of quite mis misshapen things that look a little bit like gourds or potatoes yes. or, or onions. You know, any, any mm. onions, yes. any sort of everyday vegetable mm. um, could be an inspiration as well as the more beautiful 
traditionally beautiful aspects of nature. That's why I think uh, quite a number of Tiffany vases are actually manufactured in green too. Uh, yes, yes, because of the general. because of the um, reference to nature. the reference to nature. I think yes, yeah. very much so. Fascinating. Thank you. So, Jennifer, before I ask you to talk about this magnificent mosaic, which I understand is ascribed to Joseph Briggs himself, perhaps you'd care to tell us a little bit more about how he rose to fame and fortune. Well, Tiffany took him on originally as a labourer. Of course, he landed right at a really important time in the story of Tiffany Glass, because it was around 1892-3 when um, Tiffany was expanding. He was making his own glass rather than simply working on other people's glass. So um, it was very fortuitous that Briggs landed, started working with Tiffany when he did. But he started off as a labourer, but taught himself in his spare time how to cut glass squares, mosaics. And so and Tiffany took notice of this uh, hard-working um, individual. And um, when um, his father died in 1902, uh, Tiffany would, took on the uh, silversmithing and the jewellery shop as well as doing the furnaces and the studios and the interior design and so on. And at that point he promoted Briggs to be head of the mosaic shop. So uh, that was um, quite a considerable achievement, I think. I understand that uh, Briggs has actually worked as an engraver back in Accrington. Yes, he was, a, he was a designer. He was, he was a, a, halfway through his apprenticeship as um, a calico engraver at Steiner's Printing Works in church. So he knew how to design... He, he could draw and he, he, could, was a he knew drawer, how to design. Yes, he, he was a manifest draftsman. here in the, in the Absolutely. In work. And yeah. this is a piece that we think was either made by Briggs or certainly under his auspices around 1908. And unlike the other glass samples we've got here, this is a work of art in its own right. It's a tour de force, it's an exhibition piece. It was made to show clients, potential clients, the extraordinary range of glass effects that Tiffany. Um, furnaces could produce. So you've got every sort of iridescent effect, um, glass that looks like semi-precious stones, that looks like um, agate, agate, agate and um, or every, every sort of um, mm. semi-precious stone. Um, and it was would have been taken to all the international exhibitions and um, displayed, and people could see the, the, the quality and range of the glass that uh, um, Favreau Studios were producing. Mm. So it's a very rare piece, actually, and there's only two or three other glass pictures um, known. Um, obviously different from a stained glass window. Um, it's a picture in glass, and of course it's very unusual because unlike the traditional mosaic, the glass is cut to fit the form of the th object that's being um, um, described. Mm -hmm. So you've got these very unusual... Um, mosaic shapes that are cut out and there's a uh, the the only predecessor we know is sort of italian 18th century table florentine, uh, Flo florentine mm. um, glass tables that were um, cut like this although the ones i've seen aren't as elaborate as this indeed so it is an extraordinary um, piece of work and we, briggs as i say he either made it or more likely had it made under his auspices as head of mosaic shop for tiffany he was really a, very much a man of his time, wasn't he? He arrived in the right place at the right yes, time. Yes, he did. The flowering yeah. of, of all this, this wonderful, uh, all these crafts, arts and crafts in New York at yes. the turn of the century. Yes. Uh, he, he was able to enjoy the, the building boom and exploit exactly. all the public yes, everything, buildings, everything cathedrals. Was everything was exploding. Um, obviously, um, it was a very important time in, in American history. After the Civil War, things were really building up into the sort of superpower that we have today, I suppose. This is the foundation period for that. And um, yes, extraordinary development, extraordinary you, opportunity. But you needed the talent. You did. And you did. Briggs and Tiffany between them had, had the, the talent. The eye, the skill. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And also good fortune too. Yes. This business of mosaics is fascinating actually because of course it was used uh, in many public buildings to, to line the corridors I think. And yes. I think we have another example in the museum, don't you? Where, we have. Where a sample has been produced for a bank, was it? Yes, I a think? bank in Pittsburgh. In, Pit in Pittsburgh, yes. yes. Under Briggs's auspices again. Again, I think. Where yeah. the same skill is actually used and yes. the attention to detail. Yes, it's extraordinary. Yes. Perhaps we could have a look at that. We, we certainly can. It's in the next room. Thank you. 
So let's have a closer look at this uh, sample board for that bank in Pittsburgh. Yes. Tell us a little bit more about this and why, why mosaic manufacture is so expensive. Well, if you look at the middle part of this sample, uh, this beautiful cream mosaic area, which would have gone round the edge of the bank, um, all the way around, although it's relatively plain and it, it, it's overall cream, it's made of many different coloured pieces of glass, all of which would have been positioned by hand individually to get a get a, this overall sort of mottled effect. So you, you don't get um, uh, a large number of colours of the same type in the same area. So it's extremely costly for, to produce, very time consuming. Time consuming, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, mm. yes. I'm also intrigued to see this uh, very dramatic use of colour that is clearly inspired by, well, I think North Africa here. Well, he, he was very inspired by um, the uh, visits he made to North Africa and, uh, for example, the Great Mosque of Cairo. And he saw there how when light is passed through coloured glass of various different types, it, has a, it can have a um, marvellous effect on the atmosphere of the whole interior. And this mm. inspired him very much in his um, early work as an interior designer. I think Indeed. it's very important, the Islamic influence in his work. We see that here in the geometric patterns and also in the contrasting very strong blue of lapis lazuli and the, yes. the beautiful uh, sunshine yellow. Um, yeah. It seems incredible, however, to, to think that, that this, this was actually designed to have a utilitarian Exactly. Vinyl. When you think of it, it had to be washable. Um, it was made for a public building, a bank, and um, of course glass is extremely durable, um, extremely hard wearing. We have examples just here, near here at Manchester Art Gallery, we've got Indeed. a marvellous glass staircase and, <laughs> and there's lots of examples of glass being used in architecture. It's a very mm. durable material. So we've got sort of contrast, if you like, between the beautiful um, nature-inspired uh, decorative aspects of the glass, but also something that's very, very hard wearing. So Jennifer, I understand that Tiffany was himself quite keen on landscape gardening. Do tell us a little bit more about how he became so interested in nature and how this is reflected in his glass. Well, he's reputed to have employed over 30 gardeners at his Long Island residence, Laurelton Hall, and a lot of the time was taken up with um, developing wildflower meadows, which is very unusual at the time. He liked the idea of capturing the beauty of things like wildflowers, ordinary everyday um, natural um, objects uh, in his glass. That was really the, the thing that really made him want to make glass, capturing the beauty of nature. Uh, as an Art Nouveau artist, um, that was his most important um, objective, if you like. And so he developed the flower form amongst other types of, of uh, Favril glass. And this is a very fine example of the flower form, this beautiful opalescent, in which the head of the flower is the head of the vase. The stem, obviously, is the stem of the vase, and the leaves at the bottom are on the, on the support of the, of the vase. And it really captures the beauty of um, the, the uh, wildflower, which we know as um, convalvulus, which is actually a weed. Uh, I know gardeners, uh, spend their time tearing convalvulus out of the but garden. morning glory isn't, and that's also Morning glory to isn't. It. Yes. No, but this convalvulus flower, the, the quality of the convalvulus flower is found in this vase, in that, although it's much bigger than the actual flower. Mm. Uh, the convalvulus opens and closes at, in the um, light and dark. Mm -hmm. So the fluidity and irregularity, if you like, of the top of the vase is a, 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 a reference to mm. the fluidity of the, or the movement the, the actual flower makes. Mm. Mm. Um, I think it's um, extremely evocative of movement, even, it though it, even though it is glass. Of course, the wild flower itself is white, um, but this is imbued with this beautiful uh, sunset colour effect. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that um, although you're getting a reference to a particular wildflower, you're also getting a broader reference to the beauty of nature Indeed. as a whole, Indeed. which is what, what makes this such a wonderful Art Nouveau um, artefact. Thank you very much. Around the corner, we have uh, another interesting flower form. Jennifer, yes. would you care to explain how this relates to the other work? Well, 
like the other flower form, it is based on a flower, in this case a jack in the pulpit, um, and a, which is a wildflower that's found in America. Well, I must say, I've, I've never actually seen one. And if you think of the top of the flower form vase we've just been looking at, if you pulled one of the edges downwards, um, you would get a similar form to uh, what we have of this very beautiful iridescent jack in the pulpit flower form vase. And the main reason for um, using this form is that, so that we can display, so that the um, quality of the glass is properly displayed. This marvellous gold iridescence can be seen to its full glory, if you like. So the glass is sort of opened up and flattened, almost, rather like a, a painting, so that we can really admire the amazing um, uh, technical brilliance of this, uh, of this particular vase. And its uniqueness is very apparent, isn't it, in all these little dimples? And, yes. Um, yes, there are manufacturing marks on it, which some people think are... Um, flaws. Uh, <laughs> flaws, but they're not, not flaws. They make the point unique. about Tiffany glass is that it's uh, Art Nouveau glass, and it's uh, very much the maker and the material are very much um, working together. together. So the, the maker allows the material... Mm -hmm. um, uh, to play a part, if you like, and the manufacturing to play a part uh, in the finished object. And I've heard the word onion used a lot when referring to the shape of Tiffany vases. Jennifer, how do you think that relates to this? Well, it relates in two respects. First of all, if you look at the base of the, the, the vase, which is a blown, completely blown um, vessel, um, you can see it's sort of a, a Spanish onion shape. And then the uh, gold uh, iridescence on the surface of the, um, the vase has this sort of onion, what we call an onion form. Um, sheen. Onion, onion sheen to it and the sort of uh, transparency and the um, flakes of the uh, layers of the onion um, are... Um, Quite apparent, aren't they? It's seen very, it's seen very much in the, in the surface of this. I notice also there appear to be what some might refer to as flaws yes, on the Yes, people do say that about a number of the pieces in this collection, but it isn't the case at all that, they're, that it's flawed. These are manufacturing marks. And of course, in manufacturing, um, if you're working in the arts and crafts tradition, which Tiffany was, then manufacture, the signs of manufacturing and indeed the quality of the material that itself is allowed to uh, play its part in the finished piece, so... Um, proof of uh, its uniqueness, the, Proof really. of its uniqueness and um, proof of the importance of not only the, the maker but the material and the way that it's, it's made. It's a As very a particular approach. So Jennifer, we've just been looking at two beautifully coloured objects in the warm end of the spectrum. We've now moved over to a much cooler theme. Perhaps you'd like yes. to talk about the objects in this exhibition case. Well, this is a case of objects which relate very much to the element water. And um, in this room, we've got a large number of Tiffany vases, tiles, etc., divided up into the four elements, as it were. So um, we've got a beautiful case of greens and blues, um, tiles and um, experimental vases here, uh, representing the... the uh, element of water. As an Art Nouveau artist, um, Tiffany obviously was permanently tuned into the idea of um, recreating the beauty of nature, whether it be in the uh, flowers, flowers mm -hmm. water, the sky, looking at sunsets, etc. Mm -hmm. So here's our water case. I was interested when you said experimental. Um, what is experimental here in, in this case? If you look at the, the, the smallest vases in this case, um, there, there's um, the use of uh, metals, which isn't quite resolved. If you look at the tops of the, the vases, there's an uneven or an unfinished quality about these. It's quite interesting because when American curators come over here, they say, well, if I hadn't known that these had been here since 1933, I'd deny they were Tiffany. These are very unusual pieces that we have here. Um, yes. Very, very beautiful and not very well understood. Uh, and quite modern in concept too. They are, the, I think. The they designs, are. particularly the yes. one at the back, I find uh, yes. uh, it's as though it could have been produced in the last 20 years. Really. In fact, it's slightly reminiscent in effect of the lava lamp. Yes. So it's popular yes. again now. Yes, it is indeed. Um, we're standing in front of this very beautiful 
opaque millefiori vase here. Um, this vase has very subtle peachy pinks, blues, into greens, silvered. It is very extraordinarily beautiful, mm. decorated with over 50 millefiori flowers, a dozen or so uh, leaves um, with the fronds coming from the, the top of the vase. Uh, quite a tour de force, it's very heavy. Um, it's got a wonderful Roman profile, looks like a Roman vase. Um, a marvellous vehicle for te uh, Tiffany's techniques. Indeed. Wonderful surface area to, to, to decorate, isn't that? Yes, it is very beautiful. And tell me, uh, I understand that the blue is a very popular colour. Was it actually more expensive or less expensive to produce than, than the red colours that we see in some It was less, certainly less expensive than the, the red, although not, I think, um, Blue, obviously, is in the middle of the spectrum of iridescence, if you like, um, and Tiffany is particularly known for the marvellous iridescent effects he got in his, mm. his glass. So that's one of the reasons why we do find quite a number so of, of um, blue vases, although I think gold is probably the most popular um, colour. Um, certainly, if you were looking for a vase today, you'd be most likely to come across a gold one. And let's face it, the Edwardian and the high Victorian taste was very much a, a flamboyant taste. And exactly. Anything yes. with much decoration and, and gold would exactly. be more highly yes. prized. Exactly. And the tiles that we have here in the right-hand corner, uh, I know that he, he, he liked to produce um, insects for fireplaces yes. in these wonderful glass tiles, yes. but these are rather smaller. How might these have They been are used? smaller. They could have been used in um, any sort of decorative context in a wall, in a, in a fireplace, but I think some of these look very watery. They look like ripples on the surface mm. of water. Mm. They do actually have little finger marks on them really? as well, which reminds you, although obviously um, I'm, few, people, few of us handle these, um, but it reminds you of the handmade element. Um, but if you look at that one in particular, yes. in fact, the, the three, there's a marvellous um, swirling oriental mm, decorative mm. effect in some of them. And um, he certainly used some of his tiles to extend actual water, um, as in fountains or yes. pools, on the edge of a, yes. a, an installation of a fountain or pool. Set as at Laurels and Hall. Exactly, mm. yes. Mm. Um, so the tiles would be edged, if you like, around to um, extend the idea of water beyond where the actual water was contained. Mm. Yeah, so uh, again, uh, very much um, a designer. He wasn't just a producer of vases or jewellery, but no. he was a, an interior designer. Tiffany, he started as an interior designer and they did everything really initially for the home, um, everything you can think of. Mm. So, um, Extremely, extremely talented, and of course he did design his own house. He did indeed. Um, so he was an architect as well. I also read recently that um, he was employed to decorate part of the White House, yes. but uh, a subsequent president had it all removed. He, well, he, 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 didn't, he didn't admire <laughs> Tiffany's work. No, he didn't. And of course you have to remember that people in those days, rather like we are today, we change our decorations quite rapidly, most of us. Um, things go in and out of fashion. and. Mm. Tiffany went out of fashion, and just like everything in. else, and of course has subsequently come back in, yes. Indeed. Thank you. These three very simple looking vases seem strikingly different. Can you explain what's going on here, Jennifer? Yes, we've arrived at the iridescent glass case. It's a very, very important case because it shows examples of Tiffany's iridescent glass. And when, as a young man, he visited Europe, he saw glass being excavated um, in Roman archaeological sites and the wonderful iridescent effects that you get on glass when it's been buried um, for thousands of years, you get that fracturing of the surface, these lovely petrol blues and greens and so on, mm. very subtle uh, very colours clear very often. The, uh, in the vase at the front yes, there, isn't it? Yes. It could, could be quite modern really in some ways, yes, this, this petrol yes. blue. Yes, it, mm. it, those are the, those are the colours that really inspired him to want to make mm. iridescent glass. Um, other people had done it before him. Indeed, in this country, um, in Starbridge, they were making iridescent glass in the mid nineteenth century. But what Tiffany did that those other predecessors didn't do was to make the the subtle that make uh, develop the iridescence to a point where it's so subtle it again looked like natural iridescence, mm. the sort of effects you get on a peacock 
um, feather yes. on a starling's wing. Yes. Where you see it's just a fleeting a iridescent of effect. Almost. Yes, mm. the inside mm. of the shell. Yes. It's a fleeting effect. So Tiffany is noted for his iridescent effects in glass, but he didn't invent it. What he did was he perfected it. Mm. I noticed that when you, you talked about uh, this coming from glassware which had been buried for many hundreds yes. of years, it's almost as though these, these yes. have just been dug straight out of the ground. Exactly. They, they do look like things that might have been dug up in, in or around Rome. Um, they're slightly misshapen, mm. small, mm. and indeed this piece here has a, a little uh, brass stand, similar to the sort of thing you'd find in a, in oh, a museum yes. of mm. antiquities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But of course these are all signed, Elsie Tiffany, with Favreau and a registration number. He's not passing them off, off as antiques. They are, they are his own work. Now you've just used another very technical term, Favreau. Favreau, yes. I hear it a lot when, when talking about Tiffany. What yes. is this Favreau? It's his trademark. Just his trademark. It, it, it's his trademark. And Favreau is apparently an old English word that means handmade. Made. And of course, that was the marvellous thing about Tiffany, one of the marvellous things. He um, developed all these techniques, uh, but in all of them there's a, an element of handmade in everything that he did in his Favreau glass. But he had an eye for the good market too, didn't he? Because he changed Fabril, which doesn't sound quite so elegant. That's the more French-sounding Fabril, Fabril. Yes. which yes. I think might sell better too. Yes, I think <laughs> that's, that's a very good point, yes. Hmm. The way the pattern's actually infused into the glass here reminds me very much of that gladiolus vase that we've just been looking at, Jennifer. Yes. Why is that? Well, they're the exact... They're the exact same type of vase, actually. They're Millefiori paperweight vases, both of them. But this is a really good example because you can see very clearly by looking closely at it what the process consisted of. And what is that precisely? Simply that um, the uh, maker started off with a gob of orange glass, then cut some Millefiori flowers and dispersed them across the surface of the orange glass, you can see one here. You say um, cut some millefiori yes. glass. Yes. These comes in. These come in a rod. Yes, they? like a stick of rock. Where That's anywhere right. you cut, you yes. get blackpool. Um, uh -huh. Wherever you cut, you get a little flower of this type. Uh, it's, it's sort of prefabricated and then added onto so during the process like of the glass. It's not like a transfer or painted onto the no. surface. None of that. It's no, it's an actual solid it's piece sectional. of glass. Exactly, and yes. you can see it's stuck on. If you look at that, you can see there's a halo yeah. of glass. They actually yes. added an extra piece of, mm. an extra drop of glass to make it adhere to the, mm. to the um, glass as it was being blown. And the word and Mille then, Fiore itself means thousand flowers. Exactly. It? So yes, there's not quite a thousand no, here, but no. there's quite a few. And you can see that the ones that were put on early in the process, um, after the first lot of orange glass was used, before the second lot are dark in colour and yes. they're also slightly more stretched than these ones. So you've got orange glass, extra flowers, flowers put on, more orange glass, a little bit more blowing, um, and then more flowers and then the last layer, the paperweight or transparent layer of glass, goes over these Millefiori flowers here, but no orange colour so they stay the original white colour of the of the flower. I so see. you can actually see the layers that make yes, up the Millefiori yes, technique yes. very 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 clearly in that example. So it's very is beautiful. Superimposed and embedded within the glass itself. Exactly, yes. And of course we've got all on the inside this, this wonderful opalescent luster. luster. Yes, there's a lovely luster and also you've got yeah. there's also lovely trailing fronds and um, lily pads on this uh, particular vase. Um, which Gorgeous makes it very, greens. very beautiful. Mm. Lovely greens and golds. Mm. Yes, it's a, it's a fabulous example, really mm. marvellous example of the Millefiori paperweight technique, which mm. he, um, Tiffany, was, is so famous for. It strikes me the best way to appreciate this iridescence is to actually sit by the window here and uh, let the, the vase actually catch the light. And it really is quite remarkable what we're looking at here, isn't it? It I, is. I'm intrigued by all these wonderful peacock blues and subtle petrol colours that, that seem to gleam through all this, this gorgeous gold luster that we have. Can you tell me, though, um, why it's such an odd, an odd shape? I mean, it, it really is quite futuristic, really. 
So well, th this is a very um, worked over piece of glass. I think it needed a lot of work to get it into this particular state. It's a lava glass vase and it comes from our fire case um, and it's supposed to make you think of a volcano erupting mm. and so these wonderful dribbles of, of glass down the side are reminiscent of lava. I think it's such an ambitious idea for a vase to make, to try and get the owner of the vase to think about lava erupting from a volcano. And I would imagine it, it, it would be really very difficult to control each of these yes. uh, these rivulets coming yes. down the, the surface of the vase. I think I think so, yes. So they probably again have had to have had many goes at probably it before tried they got it lots right. of times, which is one of the reasons why A it's so rare. Yes. Um, it, it, it certainly is a very rare example, this lava glass vase. Actually Jenny Jennifer, I'm I'm uh, Dying to just sort of pick it up and see whether or not I can, Do it I can see through it because from yes. where I'm sitting here, I can't believe that it's actually translucent, that yes. it's made of glass. It has this very opaque surface. I promise you, I'll, I'll do it very, very gently. <laughs> and sure enough, it is absolutely translucent. Fascinating. It points to the fact that it's difficult to appreciate things behind in glass cases very often, certainly Tiffany glass, it's a great shame that we have to have uh, have them protected by the glass case because you can't really appreciate it properly. Especially as this one is so tactile as exactly. well. Exactly, it is. Rivulets. You really you want to touch mm. these. Mm. Mm. Um, it really is very, very beautiful. And of course, you've pointed to the reason why, another reason why the lava glass vase may be so rare, which is that people didn't like them. No. Because they don't, in a sense, they don't have the traditional qualities of glass, which is translucent and light bouncing yes, off. Yes. The, the, the opacity of the surface makes you think really of um, ceramic more than, than glass. Uh, it really is a tour de force, a technical tour de force. You're very avant-garde, really, isn't it, as well, when you look at it? I think, to think that I think was some produced people 100 think, years ago. Yes, to think it was, yes, around 1900. Mm. Um, it could have been produced, you know, very recently. And obviously this isn't liquid gold that's poured over the top, it would be produced perhaps well, with metallic, metallic oxides, oxides of different, different sorts. And uh, roughly how many firings would there have to be to, to manufacture something I don't, like that? I don't know exactly. Um, it wouldn't be done in one. It, it wouldn't be done in one, it would be many, many attempts I think, because there's a lot of manipulation of temperature. And so um, much that could go wrong on in that and, period. On and off, mm. yes. Mm. Uh, up and down I think. I don't know exactly how many, but certainly a great deal of manipulation went into this, um, the making of this vase. And uh, is, each, is each piece hand signed underneath? Yes, they, they all are. I can turn it over. You can see very clearly there, look, there's um, the, the registration number 926C. LC Tiffany and the word Favril, which as we know means handmade. Handmade. That's absolutely fascinating. You know, there's a sign of relief I could see came over you there when, you when you picked it up and, uh, oh yes, thank goodness it does have the signature. That would have been awful, wouldn't it? Yes, t t if you've got a Tiffany vase that hasn't got a signature, it probably isn't a Tiffany vase. I've learned so much today, Jennifer, from being here. It really has been fascinating. But my last question is, I'd love to own a piece of original Tiffany glass. I have two questions, really. Um, if you were to own one, what kind, what example of Tiffany glass would you choose to possess? Well, I think I would probably go for a lava glass vase. I something think like there this. Are, something like this. There's a marvellous example in the Metropolitan Museum in New York of a lava glass vase. They're very rare, uh, but it's a much open, different sort of open, more open shell-like, um, equally uneven mm -hmm, vase. Mm -hmm. um, but as that's uh, rather a long way, I'd probably take this one with me. <laughs> and if I, a humble man like me, found some Tiffany glass somewhere in auction, um, what might I be on the lookout for? What do you think I might be able to afford? I think probably one of our, similar to our um, gold vases, or perhaps one of the very little blue vases. Uh, they do come up occasionally at really? auction. So, um, but of course it's a long time since they were manufactured, so they are very, very rare.
and a long time before I'll be able to afford one, but I'll start <laughs> saving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Almost a hundred years have passed since the foundation stone was laid for this delightful building. And the museum, like time itself, continues to move on, constantly evolving, and from time to time adding to its remarkable collection. In 2002, the way in which the Tiffany glass is displayed was much enhanced. The recently improved gift shop, with its own treasure trove of bespoke, yet affordable modern versions of unusual glassware, is itself worthy of a visit. With its extensive educational programme, monthly Tiffany tea talks, regular tours and visits led by curator Jennifer Rennie, its ever-changing exhibitions and fabulous hillside setting, the Howarth Art Gallery is truly a jewel in the heart of Pennine, Lancashire. It shines brighter now, I'm sure, than its munificent benefactors could ever have envisaged. Long may it continue to do so. <laughs>